I read a lot of gardening articles, especially on Facebook, Twitter, and any of the news sites that I get on. There's a there's a, an article group called Financial Times, and they had an interesting article that said how coronavirus changed the face of gardening forever. Was it a challenge last year to find seeds? Oh, it was. We had seed websites that were completely shut down. It was difficult to find things because they, they didn't have the supply. One of my favorite seed buying websites is Johnny's Seeds. Has anybody ever bought from Johnny's? I really like Johnny's. Last year, they saw a sales spike of 270%. They couldn't really keep up with the demand. And Johnny's has my favorite variety of squash called Tempest. And I had a challenge getting that squash last year. But we saw all these companies selling out. Our co-op had a difficult time keeping tomato and pepper plants in. And whenever they sold out of them, basically there were none left for the rest of the year. So it was difficult. We saw kind of an, a huge influx of gardeners because they were all stopped at home. They were all working from home and they were trying to find other things. So you see a lot of the websites, a lot of the YouTube sites that were gardening oriented saw 100% of increase of, and new thousands upon thousands of followers on their on their YouTube sites who are asking all these gardening questions. We saw a whole generation, the millennials, discovering gardening for the first time. Now I grew up in a very unique situation. I grew up in a greenhouse. So my mom still works at my aunt and uncle's greenhouse at home, but I grew up around gardening. And I take for granted all the things that I, that I learned growing up from my parents and my, my cousins and things. But as we go through this, just stop me if we've got questions. Now this is what we, this is the goal. I think all the pictures in this I took, so let me go back real quickly. My grandfather, he's, he's been gone about 21 years. He was a seed hoarder. So two years ago, my uncle gave me all these boxes and they were pill bottles of seeds. And we found all kinds of seeds and we really, and you're gonna see some other pictures of some. These seeds, even though that, that one's from 1993, it's butcher knife beans, they were still good. A lot of the old pea seeds, he was really into Southern cow peas, and we have a lot of varieties of peas. They are all still fine, even though they're dated from 1993. The other ones were from the 80s and, you know, almost 40 years old, and they still are doing fine. He had seeds in his freezer, and then they were all stored in the basement, and after 30, 40 years, are still good. This is what we want to see each year. These were some of the tomatoes I grew in the past couple of years. And the number one reason why a lot of us start some of these varieties is we're very particular about what varieties we want to grow. You can't find certain varieties like this. The one on the right is a tomato called Midnight Snack, and the, the yellow one on the, the left is called Chef's Choice Orange. You can't find these plants for sale, but those are probably two of my favorite varieties of tomatoes on the market. So let's start off with some very challenging questions, because I'm sure all of you are Jeopardy fans. What's the smallest seed in the world? No. What did you say? Oh, I thought somebody else said something. It's an orchid. And you can get something like 300,000 on the head of a pen, which is pretty crazy. What's the largest seed in the world? No. A coconut. Oh, yeah, good. Plus five on your test at the end. <laughs> How much was the most expensive seed in the world sold for? It was a pumpkin that, that hit a little over 2,000 pounds. It sold for 1,600 a seed a couple of years ago, which is absolutely crazy to me. If I went home and told my wife, I bought some pumpkin seeds today and spent $3,200, she would key my car. <laughs> All right, how many of you have said things like this? I have a brown thumb. I don't have the time and I don't have the knowledge. How many of you are scared to grow seeds? Let's start off. To, how many of you have killed something gardening? Okay, that's better. I've killed thousands, probably millions of plants at this point in my life. But sometimes we get scared to try to grow new things because we just don't have the knowledge and we just don't have the time. But how are you going to get the knowledge? You're going to get it just from trying. So the first steps that we're going to be looking at is trying to plant our seeds inside at the correct time. When is the last frost in Smith County in the spring? Was, was that the case last year? When was the last frost we had last year? We had a freeze uh, May the 7th in Wilson County, and a lot of people had already planted their tomatoes and, and peppers in warm season stuff. So we had people lost quite a few things in, uh, 
in Wilson County the first week of, of, of May. You know, gardening is a gamble. All farmers are generally gamblers to begin with. The next step is go ahead and buy the seeds, and then we're going to be talking about some of the basic materials that we should be using, and we're going to try to go through some of the potting media and how to transplant and some of the other things, such as hardening off. <clears throat> How many of you know the difference between the two main branches of seeds? What's the prefix di mean? It means two. And what's the prefix mono mean? One. So you have a dicotyledon and a monocotyledon. A cotyledon is the true seed leaves that are inside the seed. So all dicots have two true seed leaves, and a monocot has one true seed leaf. A monocot is generally things in the grass family, corn, onions, and a dicot generally beans and other things like that. So whenever you have seeds coming up, the first two leaves that come up are always the cotyledons. So they were actually where all the energy was stored for them to start growing. And I've gotten calls in the past couple of weeks is those cotyledons, those first two leaves that grow, eventually they will shed themselves, they'll die off and new true leaves will actually come up. I'm gonna show you some pictures here later on. So don't go into a panic mode because the, the cotyledons that first come up, the, the new leaves, they're not going to keep growing. They're eventually going to fall off. So someone sent me some pictures last week and they said, all these leaves are falling off. And that's common. The first two true leaves fall off anyways. This was a, I want to show you can pretty much grow anything from seeds. How many of you know what that seed pot is from? I took this picture about three years ago. That's an elephant ear. So I collected some elephant ear seeds and elephant ear seeds are, are really sticky. So we go through and I, I was teaching high school then, we had kids smearing them on plates. Kind of like I said, just smear them on the plates like you would a booger. So they, they smeared them on all these plates and then we dried and we actually had all these baby elephant ears popping up. You can pretty much grow anything from seeds. And like we were talking about earlier, the smallest seed in the world is the orchid. You can even grow some of these orchid seeds in, in you know, test tubes and things like that. But pretty much, if it develops the seeds, it's not a challenge to grow. <clears throat> Why do we do this to begin with? We want to grow the variety we want. We want to grow exactly how many we need, and we also want to determine the planting date for, for us. So ideally, during a normal year, our last frost is, someone said, April the 14th, April the 15th. Now, last year, that was not the case. Here in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start seeing tomato plants in the garden centers and the box stores and things like that. That's not a great time to begin planting any of these things. But I think they sell them early because they know they can sell them to you again in just a couple of weeks. But with this new <laughs> influx of gardeners, they're going to learn, their if it's their first year especially, they're going to kill a few things as they go along the way. But we need to make sure that we're determining and we're actually growing some of our seedlings inside at the correct time of when we need to plant them, which is ideally April the 15th through April the 20th, generally. Now we always know that the weathermen are always right. So just listen to them. <clears throat> if you have a, a large amount of old seeds, this was some more old seeds for my grandfather. He was into these tiny, tiny peas called lady peas. Just wet a paper a towel, put them in a, in a Ziploc bag and kind of sit them in the sunny window for just a couple of days. If they're still good, they'll start growing pretty quickly. And that way you can determine their seed germination. So all the seeds that we generally buy at the store, they're only allowed to be sold for one year. So at the bottom of the seed pack somewhere, it'll say seed ger test germination 2019. And that's mainly the ones that are going to be sold for 2020. And what's sad is all those seeds that are still good, Lowe's co-op garden centers, they have to get rid of them. They either throw them away, donate them to somebody because it's illegal to sell seeds that are out of date, even though they're fine to begin with. I run the Master Gardeners in Wilson County and Lowe's brought us six huge boxes of seeds last week that they had to literally throw out because it, they can't sell them anymore. And I got, I stole some from our co-op a couple of weeks ago from last year from their warehouse. But a lot of these seeds, they're, they're still good. Y'all have probably seen the stories and the articles of them finding wheat seeds in some tomb in Egypt, germinating them, and they still actually grow. They did find a seed that was around 2,000 years old. It was a type of palm. It was in one of the Egyptian tombs, and it grew just fine. If they're in stored properly, you know, not too hot, not too humid, kind of dry, they'll do just fine. 
it doesn't really matter the date. So I planted a whole row of these lady peas in my garden, didn't test the germination. I just threw them out to see if they would grow and probably 95% of them grew and they're almost 40 years old right now. And he had kept them in an old pill bottle and they were probably just kept in the basement. So let's talk about when we actually start some of these things. And there's a, there's a really good chart inside your document. I'll, I'll show you in just a second. If you're growing cool season things that form ahead, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, they need to be started about the second week of February because we're going to begin transplanting those things about March the 15th. So if you wanted to grow cool season things, you can still get them out, but you're going to be planting them a little bit later. We grow the cool season things a little bit earlier because they can handle degrees like 27, 28 degrees. They can handle some of these light frosts. So if you, you still got time theoretically to plant some of these cool season things, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and kale. I grow some of my leafy things from transplants just because it's easier for me to do that. <clears throat> if you're doing the warm season things that you'll generally start inside, such as the tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant, we're gonna start those about the 15th of March. So generally it's anywhere from four to six weeks when you're gonna start something inside to make a usable transplant for you to plant it outside, if that makes sense. So if you started your tomatoes, and I've seen pictures on Facebook already, of people who started their tomatoes in January, it's gonna be extremely hard to keep that tomato until when you should plant it between April the 15th through April the 20th. We had someone from another county send some pictures of some tomatoes that a lady had started right in the middle of winter time and they were already probably a foot, <laughs> a foot and a half tall. And she was trying to keep them until April the 15th and she had just started them six months a little too early <laughs> before they needed to be planted in the garden. We need to time these things right. It helps them not stretch out and it kind of gives us the, the nice stocky plant that we want to put in the garden. <clears throat> Candidates for direct seeding. A lot of the things that we grow in the garden doesn't really like to be transplanted. Squash, such as our cucurbits, watermelons, cantaloupes, they have really sensitive roots on them. They work 10 times better if we directly plant those seeds in the ground. Other things such as corn, okra, greens, beans, zinnias, sunflowers, a lot of these work out 10 times better if we just directly transplant them into the garden. There's just some, some more knowledge. Has anybody ever heard of Neil's Paymaster corn? <clears throat> One, yeah, Neil's Paymaster corn was developed in the 1920s in Wilson County, Tennessee. My building's called the Neil Building but it was the, one of the first row crop corns that had two ears on the same stalk. So Neil, uh, his name is William Haskell Neil, he uh, developed this corn, started kind of collecting seeds for it. And he's actually in the Tennessee Ag Hall of Fame. And he grew up in a community called Tucker's Crossroads out in Wilson County. But I was asking my uncle one time, my uncle's a seed hoarder. And I said, I'd like to find some of this Neil's Paymaster corn. I said, I think it's really cool. And he went to his freezer and pulled out a bag that was about 40 years old. And we planted a whole row and every one of them came up. So that, it's just a neat uh, heirloom type corn. So there's just some more useless Jeopardy knowledge. So how does it develop? Did he, did he just Selective. Well, most corn is just going to be pollinated. It's wind pollinated. So it's going to, he went through the, the fields and just collected seeds on the ones that had two stalks and then started growing those. And it was quite a few year process. And then he mainly after a few years, all the stalks had two years. So just selective hybridizing some of them. And that's kind of how we got some of these things like collard greens. So the colonists brought cabbage over and cabbage does not grow real well in the heat of, uh, of the Southeast. So they started selecting for just large ears and no heads. And that's how slowly collards came about. So it's kind of interesting on some of these things, just selecting, keeping the seeds on the ones that they liked. That makes sense. Did I muddy the waters? No. Okay. Not. You looked confused and I'm well, like, oh I was, no. I, I was <clears throat> trying to think, you were talking about how um, seeds from 40 years ago from your pa yeah. and they grow really well in the heat. Yeah. When I order my seed and my herbs and things like that, I order from um, Baker's Creek. Yep. And all of my all of my herb seed that I get, it says to over sow because of low germination. And 
there, I mean, I've seen seed packets of germination, say 60% germination, 70%, which is low. Um, so like not every seed that we're going to plant is going to begin with, or it's going to plant anyways. If, if I went back through on those pea seeds from my, my grandpa, it was probably, probably 85 or 90% that actually grew, which, which was actually shocking to me. But we over sow, like greenhouses, they'll sell plug trays of plants, but they over sow. So each tray generally on plugs will have 288 holes, but they only sell the tray having 250 plants because some seeds just won't germinate. So they, they basically plant 38 extra on those trays. And if they come up, that's a bonus for you. If not, you know, you're not charged for them anyways. That makes sense again? Mm -hmm. Okay. I ramble a little bit and I don't mean to. Vine, vine crops, like we were talking about, the cucurbits, the cantaloupes, the watermelons, the squashes, they prefer to be directly planted. And their only reason why is they stretch out so quickly when they're actually in small cups. And I see watermelons, cantaloupes, cucumbers, and things planted or at, at local garden centers for sale. And after a couple of weeks, they start twisting together. And then when you try to buy it, you're breaking them apart. And they, like I said earlier, they have such sensitive roots, they break so easily. They don't transplant well due to the root injury and, and they just need to be directly sown into the garden. The issue with vine crops, if the soil is cold and wet, what's going to happen to it? It's gonna rot. So a lot of these things need the soil temperature to be 55 or 60, which is really not until almost May to begin with. And if you've ever had a, a you, know, you can get a compost thermometer or soil thermometer and just see what your soil temperature is. If it's 40 degrees, the April the 20th, it's not a great time to plant anything like that directly sown into the garden. That's when we'll have some of our rot issues. And in one of the publications, maybe, maybe Chris made it too, it's called the Tennessee Vegetable Garden. So hopefully you picked up that publication. In that publication is this chart, because one of the questions, if you're a brand new gardener, you have no clue what needs to be transplanted into the garden. You have no clue what needs to be directly sown by seeds into the garden. And sometimes if, if you've been gardening quite a few years, it's just kind of a trial and error. You've seen what worked and what didn't work. So this was a good chart in one of those publications, it's on the corner of this table here, and it shows what should be directly planted, and it shows what should be transplanted in the garden. Now, a lot of the things that's on here, I, I transplant kohlrabi. I generally plant uh, kale, transplant kale just because it's easier for me, and they get pretty large, but you can kind of see right here, a lot of things, you can start them inside and actually transplant them, but this was just a good chart to show you. Here's what can be transplanted, and here's what can be directly sown into the garden. Directly sowing into the garden, we need to kind of make sure that we're getting it right. So these were some turnip greens that I planted in the garden about August the 20th, two years ago. And I wanted to show you, this was about a week and a half difference right here. And the only reason the turnip greens did so well is I planted them right before, you know, the weatherman, he said 90% chance of rain. So that's the issue. So we have people who will directly sow seeds into the garden, and then it's going to be dry for 10 days. That's going to be rough on it because what happens is the surface of the soil becomes a really hard crust and those seeds can't actually break through. If you're going to directly sow anything, cucumbers, greens, lettuce, anything like that, try to get it when you are 100% sure that it's going to rain that day or make sure you're giving a supplemental water. I try not to water my garden. I know that's crazy. I see a lot more issues with overwatering than we do underwatering. A lot of these blights, a lot of these diseases come from overhead sprinklers, powdery mildew on some of those squashes and things. I think it's best to kind of keep things underwater than it is overwater. On the seeds, make sure you're buying from reliable sources. There are great seed websites you can buy from. And I don't know if y'all remember the whole buzz. Was it last year? Seeds were coming from China to everybody's mailboxes. and th We had people asking about our office. Make sure you're getting reliable seeds from reliable countries. And if you were to get seeds from another country, there's a whole headache of phytosanitary certificates they're supposed to have. These are just some of the seed companies that I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Johnny's, Baker Creek, Territorial. Osborne is more of a commercial vegetable type place. White Harvest Seed Companies in Missouri, Seed Savers Exchange. 
there are a number of great seed companies that we can buy from. And I wanted to mention on the differences between hybrid versus open pollinated, and there are pros and cons to some. So a hybrid, better boy tomatoes. If I planted four better boy tomatoes and I planted four chef's choice orange, which is my favorite tomato, and I planted them side by side, they're both hybrids. If I kept those seeds for next year, are they gonna be exactly the same thing? Is that, if I collected seeds from those better boy tomatoes, are they gonna be better boys next year? More than likely not. Hybrids cross extremely easily. A lot of the open pollinated is a lot of the heirloom stuff and it generally will stay the same. So I wanted to mention, we have people who will, will save their seeds on Park Swap or who will save their seeds on, on Roma or Rutgers or something like that. And they, if they had any other tomato around, they'll usually cross really easily because tomatoes are generally insect pollinated. And uh, we mentioned that corn, generally corn is wind pollinated, but if you have a bunch of other varieties of corn all in the same garden, they'll cross extremely easily. And if you wanted to keep your, your corn seed pure, I think it has to be 600 feet, I think from the other corn, because that's how, how light that pollen is, it blows through the wind. Yep, is it easy? <laughs> okay. Um, in the fall, we buy pumpkins. Yep. They're all kind of pretty pumpkins. Yeah. I have a green one. Yep. If I take that seed from that green pumpkin, they're not going to come out good. Nope. They're going to be everything. Whatever the farmer had in his field. And we had someone, I was at a farm Monday or Tuesday this week, and the lady said, Well, we kept seeds from some pumpkins and we planted them, and they were just a hodgepodge of, I mean, they can kind of look like gourds sometimes, some of the. Pumpkins cross extremely easily. So most pumpkin farmers, we have one that's got about 10 acres. And I bet he has 25 or 26 varieties in that field, but it's going to be a cross of, you know, whatever the pollen came from. You know. And if you are trying to keep pumpkins, corn, and other hybrids like that completely pure, it's just best to buy seeds each year, if you can find them, I guess. Are there any other questions? All right. Last year kind of taught us to don't overbuy. A couple of weeks ago, I went to the co-op to get a couple of things. The, the guy before me bought $200 worth of seeds already. We have people stockpiling this stuff already. Leftover seeds can be saved each year and it's best to keep them in a fridge. I have quite a few corn seeds in my, in my freezer right now. And that's where my uncle kept them and I kind of kept them in that state. But we see people kind of overstocking on some seeds. They don't store them well and then the next year they don't germinate well. On the growing media, and this is a question that gets asked all the time. My favorite growing media is something that's extremely fine textured. My favorite growing media is difficult to find now. It's a tobacco seed starter mix. A lot of the co-ops used to carry that years ago when we had tobacco farmers. And I don't think y'all have tobacco farmers. You have a couple. Our co-op, you know, I have to go to a Macon County co-op, I think, to find it. It's just a general, really fine textured seed selling media that tobacco farmers use for their seeds in their float beds. And that's my favorite kind. It's extremely cheap, but it can be difficult to find. I went to another co-op a little bit south of us and they said, we haven't had it in years. So you may have to go somewhere closer to Kentucky or maybe y'all's co-op have it. It needs to be extremely fine textured. We don't need to be using garden soil. It's heavy. A lot of our garden soils are not that great for starting seeds. Nobody in here has clay, right? All right. Also, we can bring in some insect eggs. We can bring in some diseases. A lot of the blight issues that we have with tomatoes is soil borne. And if we try to start some tomato seeds in some of this garden soil that has some of these issues, we're just gonna be transplanting that on. It's also sterile. So they actually cook the weed seeds, they cook the insect eggs, they cook a lot of this stuff before they're allowed to sell it. Also a good growing media has equal parts peat moss, vermiculite and perlite. And I'll talk about the differences between vermiculite and perlite in just a second. <clears throat> we see all sorts of brand names and, and I'm not trying to say one of these is better than the other. They all work out fine. It just needs to be something that's fine textured. We don't need to be using the heavy, we'll see bags at Dollar General for $3 to say top soil. This stuff's so heavy, it's not really gonna work out. But anything that's really light and fine textured. Hey, can I get a bottle of water, Chris? I mentioned earlier, you can have three different things in a real good media. 
you have peat moss, vermiculite, and perlite. Now, vermiculite and perlite are both volcanic rocks. They heat them and they kind of pop like popcorn. Vermiculite itself is used for soil hold or water holding capacities. Generally, vermiculite is used on the top after we plant our seeds inside. So I'm going to show you some of the pictures that we've done in the past. So most of the things that I grow in the si inside are tomatoes and peppers. That's my favorite things to grow. Perlite is used for aeration. It's that little white rock that we see in the soil and it's used to just try to help drain the soil some. So if we were looking at these, vermiculite is generally used on top. These were some tomatoes that we planted a couple of years ago. That's that midnight snack. If you're a cherry tomato fan, midnight snack is a really good one. Um, it's red, it's got an indigo blue top on it and it's a powerful little cherry tomato. But what, the way we plant our tomato seeds is we go ahead and get the trays ready. We put the fine textured media into the trays. We put our seed down. I mainly just barely push the seed into the soil. And then I put just a really thin layer of vermiculite on top. Because what that vermiculite's going to do, it's like a sponge. When it gets wet, it just swells up and holds water next to that seed. The one issue that we see with seeds not germinating properly is they dry out at a critical point when they need to be sending out roots or they need to be sending out leaves. So you don't moisten that before you put your seed on? No, it's moist and then we put our seed on. We put our soil down or media, we moisten it and then put the seed down, yeah. But usually we've got a bin that we use of our media. We'll put all the soil in there and then we mix it with water. Because if you've ever tried to plant a seed in something that's kind of dry, you water it, it's just going to float away. That was a good point. I should have made that point. Sorry about that. <laughs> now y'all are keeping me on my toes. <laughs> Lay across the top, dust the top with soil or vermiculite. And some of these seeds, if they're planted too deep, they'll rot. And I like to put vermiculite on top. And most co-ops have vermiculite and it's extremely cheap. You can get a huge bag of vermiculite or perlite for just a few dollars. And it'll be enough vermiculite to last you the rest of your life. <laughs> Avoid the window seal. I have seeds in my windowsill at home right now. So this is the pot calling the kettle black a little bit. They need consistently warm soil. The coolest places in our house is next to the windows. So if we have some of these warm season vegetables like tomatoes or peppers, and the temperature in our house is 72, usually by the windows it's 64, 65. The issue it results in bent seedlings with tall scraggly stems. Now on tomatoes, that's not an issue, why? You can plant them up to their neck and they'll do fine. Are, is there anything else vegetable-wise that forms roots along their stems? No. If the rest of the things, cabbage, broccoli, peppers, if you bury them up to their neck, they're going to rot. So really the only thing that, that's, uh, that's fine with kind of those leggy stems is tomatoes. And also the main issue is cool temps and those plants, it's called phototropism. They grow toward the light. So you think, I'm going to just turn it every day. It's just going to kind of look really bad if you do that. These were some seeds. And I was talking earlier, you can grow anything from seeds. You'll probably never guess what these are. These were some that I collected a couple of years ago. These are hydrangeas. So we collected some hydrangea seeds. We had this some me and some kids when I was teaching. We had some white paper plates. We took the old hydrangea bloom. We kind of dusted and all the seed fell on the plates. And we just kind of sowed them just to see what happened. And 99% of them grew. So on the idea of containers, we can grow pretty much seedlings in whatever you have available. Peat pots, the poo pots, the new ones that are made out of manure, milk jugs, porous trays. And it's ideally if you're reusing trays every year to just wash them in a 10% bleach. Why? Diseases. It just kind of knocks out some of those diseases that you may have had. The main disease that we have with seedlings is called damping off. And damping off is a fungus that's usually on the container and sometimes it can come in on the soil, but it's keeping the soil too wet. The seedling rots off at the soil line and just falls over like a little tree. Also, it's best to start your seedlings into a separate tray than you're gonna finish growing them off on because <laughs> transplanting, it'll be 10 times better to transplant them. And I'll show you some transplanted plants that were not transplanted at the right stage. You can buy anything like this online. 
The one on the right is called a 606 tray. It's six plants per six pack, and there's six packs per tray. The other one is just a, a shallow germination tray. But we've seen people using moisture type chambers like this that you can buy on Johnny's or any of these other seed websites. And I mentioned earlier, the main issue why a lot of seeds fall is germination or is, the, is they're just get too dry at the wrong point of when they're trying to grow. And there's a fine line between overwater and underwater. And I think it's always best to try to err on the side of caution of keeping them a little dry as opposed to just keeping them too wet. Because roots are just like people. Roots have got to breathe. And if we have these roots sitting in water the entire time, they're not breathing right. We see people using these sandwich containers and they work out fine too. So if you were, you know, at the restaurant and you had some to go and it had a clear top, this is a perfect miniature greenhouse to start some of these seeds in. Another reason why some fail is they just get too cold and we need to be using a heating mat that's actually ideal for getting wet. We can't be using the heat mat that we use on our back because it's not supposed to get wet. You can buy these little seedling heat mats and, and they work out fine. <clears throat> they also help the roots grow a lot faster if they're warm. Um, I wanted to show you, this is a little bed that we have. My uncle has a greenhouse I use on some of his seedlings, but he has a bed that's, it's probably four foot by four foot and he has sand in it but he ran heating cables all through the sand. And I've also seen people use those Christmas lights that are in that clear casing. They can get a little warm and put those under their ceilings because bottom heat helps out 10 times uh, get these roots are going. Light, generally supplemental light is, is needed. And you can buy these various types of grow lights on many websites right now, if you can still find them, but generally, they're, the lights are too far away from the seedlings. They only need to be about four to eight inches away from your germinating seeds. Because when they start stretching, they're trying to find the light and they don't have enough light if they're two or three feet above it. Stretching will occur if it's actually too dim. So I see a lot of pictures on Facebook and, and the lights will be four feet, five feet. I mean, it's huge. I mean, we'll have a, a light. Um, just make sure that just right above the ceilings, they're not gonna get too hot. They're gonna be fine. Uh-oh, someone's uh -oh. calling. That could be Ed McMahon. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Problems that we have sometimes with seeds. Seed does not emerge. So people will call and they'll say, well, my seeds didn't grow. Well, here's just some issues that could have happened. It could have been really old seeds. The media could be too wet or too dry. The temp could have been too high or too low or seeds could have been planted too deeply. And sometimes when people call, they want a definitive answer. We don't always have the definitive answer of, of why something failed, but that was just a couple of the problems of why it didn't even begin to grow with. Another issue in a greenhouse, or if you've got them in a garage, one we've had hiccups with, mice. Have y'all ever had mice digging in your seeds? I guess nobody's had that bro. <laughs> Tall, scraggly seedlings, the, the light intensity was too low. We could have actually over fertilized some of these and they just stretch out. And like I said earlier, I like my soil media to not have fertilizer. I really don't because they're so tender at that age. I was explaining to someone earlier, these roots are so sensitive when they're young. If, if, it, if the soil mixture was not mixed up properly, it can have large pockets of fertilizer in it. And then once it actually hits some of those roots, it could burn. The temp could have been too high at night and plants not spaced properly. That was just some of the reasons why we get scraggly seedlings. Now, how tall should the light have been from the seeds? Four to eight inches. They gotta be right on top of it. I wanted to make sure y'all were awake. So these seedlings over here, they were transplanted too young. And that's actually some Brussels sprouts. So like I said, the first two leaves pop out. What were those called? Cotyledons. What happens to them after a couple of weeks? They fall off. So this one right here, does it have any leaves? No, it just has cotyledons still. So the issue with, with some of these, they probably won't make it. We need to transplant things whenever they have true leaves starting to develop. If we're transplanting things when they're still just cotyledons, they're probably gonna to fail to begin with. A couple of other is leaf issues. 
I always like to err on the side of caution. Minimal fertilizer for me on this small stuff because it stretches or it burns so easily. If it's purple, there could be two hiccups. It could be either phosphorus deficient or it could be too cold. And if it's just straight up yellow, it could be, uh, it just needs a little dose of nitrogen. But that's two of the main issues we've seen with just growing some of the seeds. So on these seeds right here, are these okay to transplant at that stage? These are geraniums. No. No, why? It's just the cotyledons. There's no true leaves. We can start, we're actually starting to see some true leaves pop up in the middle of some of these, but it's nothing big enough to transplant yet. On the, on the cool season stuff and things like that, I wanted to kind of hit on just a couple of dates and I've just got a few other slides and then we'll open it up to any questions y'all may have. On the timing, ideally, most of the seeds should grow in about a week overall. Some things can take a couple of weeks just depending on the seeds. Now, this is the soil temperature. Generally, in a house, it's going to be a little bit cooler between 50 and 65. So cabbage and broccoli, lettuce, some of the cool season things are going to grow within about 10 days. Squash, if we were having to plant some inside to transplant, it's usually going to grow pretty fast within four to 10 days. But that was just a general chart on on how long. If you planted tomatoes a month and a half ago and they still haven't came up, there's probably something else wrong. On transplanting, I can't harp on it enough. Wait for true leaves to actually come out. On tomatoes, they'll come out really fast. Those cotyledons will fall off, but it could be three to four weeks before you actually get true leaves. 14 to 16 hours a lot will, will prevent stretching and also watch those roots. It depends on the container. If we've got a really small container and the roots are starting to flush out from the bottom of it, it may be time to transplant it already and gradually start fertilizing whenever we start to see those true leaves. The cotyledons themselves have a lot of stored energy and they'll be fine for a couple of weeks without any fertilizer. <laughs> Making it a usable plant from seed on some of these things generally takes about six weeks. For some reason, I thought my lot clicker would work, but peppers and eggplants generally would take a couple of weeks longer. But what we're looking for in a usable plant is something that's short, something that's stocky, and something that has true leaves on it. So these have actually been transplanted. These were some beefsteak a couple of years ago. They had been transplanted, and this was about five or six weeks old. They were short, they were stocky, they were dark green, they weren't yellow. And uh, if you go to the store and you find something, this is what you need to be buying. If you're buying your tomatoes and you're not want to you know, grow them yourself. If you see a lot of issues with the plant, you see aphids, you see holes in the leaves, it's best to leave that there for somebody else. <laughs> Hardening off, I love kohlrabi. I think it's underused in Tennessee. These plants, if we had them inside our house, our garage for six weeks, and we've got a really great crop of tomatoes and we take them and throw them outside in full sun, what's gonna happen to them? They're going to burn up. They're going to get sunburned. They're going to die. They're not going to be happy at all. We need to gradually move those things to a shady location and just do that every day, just for a few days to kind of acclimate them to wind, acclimate them to some rain, acclimate them to some sunshine. Try an overcast day. And what this is going to do, it's going to thicken the cell walls on the cuticle layer, which is on the top of the leaf. Like if we've been inside all winter, and then we go outside for a really sunny day. What's going to happen to us? We'll get sunburned too. It's just kind of the same principle for the plants. We kind of have to acclimate those things. I want this is put on my contact information. If you got any questions, you can send them to Chris. You can send them to me. I'm able to get y'all out of here right on time. You can, my email is lholman1 at utk.edu. That's my office number. And I wanted to mention this other publication right here, the Tennessee Vegetable Garden. It has a lot of the things that I mentioned in it. I also wanted to mention a newer horticulture website called uthort.com. A lot of the newer publications that are coming out from UT are on that website. We have a lot of newer vegetable garden publications coming out every couple of weeks, it seems like. A lot of them are very specific to tomatoes, peppers, squash, potatoes, and things like that but check out uthort.com.